This is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you one of the 47 million Americans who benefit from group insurance? Listen carefully to this message from Mr. R. M. Kane, president of the Abbott Laboratories, manufacturers of pharmaceutical products. Mr. Kane says, we take pride in our complete group insurance program, which we have worked out with the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. We are especially proud to have been the first company to provide for the payment of most of the hospital and doctor's bills for our employees and their dependents. The company is glad to pay the cost of four forms of employee coverage and to share with employees the cost of other protection for themselves and their dependents. Yes, group insurance is something worth owning. In 13 minutes, the Equitable Life Assurance Society will give further important information about group insurance. Tonight's FBI file, Blueprint for Murder. Some men in every community are genuine public servants. They are the ones who help raise money to build the new wing on the hospital. They are the ones who are serving now as chairman of the drive to raise funds for the USO. They are the ones who believe that every man is indeed his brother's keeper. Without those men, America would be a bankrupt nation. Indeed, a vanquished nation. For those are the men who, in the darkest hours of defeat, rose to the heights that led us on to victory. They were everywhere on the battlefield and on the home front. But we are not a nation composed entirely of heroes. For there were some during the war who took advantage of their fellow citizens, just as there are some who are doing that very thing today. Tonight's file opens in a small western city. They're in the living room of an old house occupied by Frank Madison and his wife Mary. Sunday afternoon a few weeks ago, and the Madisons have just returned from church when the doorbell rings. Yes? Are you Mrs. Madison? That's right. Well, I'm Walter Douglas. Is Mr. Madison at home? Yes, he is. Won't you come in, please? All right. Someone for you, Frank. Okay, I'll be right in, hon. Won't you please sit down, Mr. Douglas? Thank you. Uh, you'll keep a very neat house, Mrs. Madison. I, uh, I wish you'd mention that when my husband comes in. I will, but doesn't he tell... Well, 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 here's the town hero now. Hello, Mr. Douglas. Hello, Frank. I hope you don't mind my calling you Frank. Why, not at all. I suspect you've been calling me some other things recently. <laughs> well, then you know why I'm here, and that'll save us some time. I think I do know why you're here, but I'd rather hear it from you. All right. You were down at the county clerk's office a week ago with an engineer. That's right. And you were checking my blueprints and specifications for the bridge my firm is building down at the river. Right again. I knew the clerk would call you after I left. And then you were up to talk to some of my men who were working on the bridge job, and they let you have some samples of the materials we're using. And I don't mind telling you now that the quality of those samples didn't come up to your specifications. Oh, you've already gotten a report back on them, huh? Came back yesterday. Look, son, when you went away from here four and a half years ago, you were working in Tom Jenkins' garage as a grease monkey, remember? Like it was yesterday. And when you came home, the town was so grateful that we all chipped in and bought you your own garage. I remember that, too. Now's the time to get down to cases, then. Who do you think bought that garage? Why, the people of Jefferson County. Yes, in a way they did. 
But I'm the one who started it through my Sunflower Social Club. I put the whole thing over. In other words, Walter Douglas gave you that garage, son. And now Walter Douglas wants me to forget about the report I got, huh? That's right. I couldn't do that, Mr. Douglas. I've just been elected city chairman of the Betty Government Group. Yes, I know. Frederick Baker's organization, but... Baker doesn't know you've gotten the report back yet, does he? No, but he will. How much will you take to tear up the report? Now, look, Mr. Douglas, I can take only so much. You better get out of here now. You might find it a little dangerous, tangling with an organization like mine, son. I don't scare that easy, Mr. Douglas. I'll take my chances. Come in and close the door, Louie. Sit down, Louie. Yeah. Louie, I got a job for you. Oh, good, boss. I'm getting out of practice lately. What's the job? Yes, sir. Miss Jenkins, get me Buddy up at the cabin, will you? Uh, Louie, you know that garage down at Main and Fifth Street? Yeah, yeah, sure. Ain't that the place where we had all the music? Yes, and... Louie, that's the place. You ever been inside? Yeah, uh, Sure. I had a flat fix there two weeks ago. It was the funniest thing. Save that... it, Louie. I haven't got time for the story now. Okay, I'll tell you later. Sure. Remember the job you did three years ago on the old turnpike? Uh, the fire? That's the one, yes. Oh, you want us to burn down a guy's garage? No, no, no. Not entirely, Louie. I don't think we have to go that far. Oh. You want, uh, like a one alarm fire, they should get there in time to put it out, huh? That's it, Louie. That describes it perfectly. If there's a small fire that damages about, oh, say, 25% of the place, I, I think that'll be sufficient. So when do you want the job done, boss? Sometime within the next 48 hours. Okay, I'll do it Monday night. Hello? Oh, hello, Mr. Douglas. Hey, I learned a new song today on the fiddle. That's fine, buddy, it's fine. Listen, on uh, Monday night, Louie will be up to the cabin. All right, Mr. Douglas. Say, do you want me to play the song to you over the telephone? Not right now, buddy, no. Goodbye. Louie. Yeah, boy. Buddy will have everything ready for you on Monday night at the cabin. Go up there after the job, but don't come back down for about a week. Right. Heat ought to be off by then, and... Now, listen, don't forget, not too big a fire. Just enough to scare <laughs> In a large nearby city, Wednesday morning found two old friends seated at a desk in the field office of the FBI. Special Agent Jim Taylor spoke first. Well, it's good to see you again, Frank. I wish I could say the same, Jim. <laughs> what kind of a crack is that to make? I'm here on business, Jim. Oh? Well, what's the trouble? Well, let me go back to the beginning. All right, guy, go ahead. A couple of weeks ago, I was elected city chairman of the local better government group. Well, I couldn't have picked a better man. Oh, thanks, Jim. Well... Right off the bat, I decided to look into the bridge that's being built down our way by Walter Douglas. You didn't have to tell me who was doing the job. He's built everything in this county except a good reputation. You said it. Now, go on, Frank. Well, we took some samples of the stuff he's building the bridge with and sent them to a laboratory, and I just got the report back. I can guess what it shows. It shows that the bridge is going to be a danger to life and limb. That bad, huh? Yeah, that bad. Last Sunday, after Douglas knew I had the report, he came to the house and told me it'd be dangerous to tangle with him. Was he able to walk out under his own power? Oh, I didn't touch him. That's all he's looking for. Oh, Frank, any witnesses to his threat? No. Mary was in the kitchen. Oh, that's too bad. Well, go on. What happened then? Well, last night, there was a fire at my garage. Oh? It started at about 9.30, an hour and a half after I went home. Oh, any evidence that Douglas did it? Oh, none that I found. Somebody sneaked in and slugged my nightman, and while he was unconscious, they started the fire. Well, then your nightman didn't see who did it. No. Jim, what can you do for me? Well, Frank, uh, I'll tell you what I'd do if I were in your place. What? I'd bring a lawsuit against the city and against Douglas, claiming that the bridge is a danger to life and limb. Oh, but that'll take too long, Jim. I want to get I, some... I know what you want to do. Now, in addition to the action against the city and Douglas, you also get a temporary injunction against the city. For well, what? prevent them from paying any more of the taxpayers' money to Douglas until after the action comes to court. 
You think that'll do it? I know it will. Why, well, that'll tie his hands so tight he'll think he's wearing handcuffs. Thanks, Jim. I'll let you know how I make out. Right, Frank. And give my best to Mary. You want me, boss? Yeah, Louis. Come in and close the door. I've got another job for you. We're going to make a little trip. Oh, yeah? Where am I going? Up to my lodge in the mountains. All alone? Oh, you'll have company. Now, listen to these instructions carefully, Louis. Yeah, boys. I can't afford to have you make any mistakes this time. I'll be real careful, honest. All right. Now, on the way up to the lodge, you go through a town named Medford. Med- yeah, yeah, I know where it is. Frederick Baker lives up there. He's head of the better government group that Frank Madison is connected with. Uh-huh. Now, when you get to Medford, go to the telegraph office and send this telegram to Madison. It's telling him that a car is being sent in to pick him up. And it's signed Frederick Baker. Yeah, yeah, I got you. That's easy, boy. All right. Then go on up to the lodge and get Buddy to drive back down here with you. Well, what do I need him for? Because the two of you are going to pick up Frank Madison, blindfold him, take him back up to the lodge, and keep him there until his case comes up in court. out at the door, dear? Western Union, hon. Oh? Who's it from? Oh, it's from Mr. Baker. Hmm. What's he say? He wants me to come up and see him tonight. Well, does he say what it's about? No, but maybe the group has dug up something new about Douglas. Oh, what time do you have to leave? Mr. Baker says his car will pick me up at 7. Oh, golly, it's only a couple of minutes from now. You Say, so it is. Well, I don't have it to pack anything. I'll be back later tonight. Okay, I'll wait up for you, dear. Okay, and if I should have to be gone overnight, I'll call on. All right, dear. Oh, there's the car coming in the driveway right now. Yeah, I guess that's it, all right. It's certainly nice of him to send his car all the way in for you, isn't it? I'll go, dear. All right. Mr. Madison? Yes, are, are you from Mr. Baker? That's right. Okay, I'll be with you in a minute. Mary, will you will you hand me my hat, hon? Oh, sure I will, but where is... Oh, it... oh, here it is. Here Thanks. It is. I'll see you later. See you later, dear. Oh, it's certainly a beautiful night, isn't it? Yeah. Nice driving through the country tonight. Mm-hmm. How long did it take you to drive down from Medford? Oh, about 35 minutes. No traffic tonight. Uh, where do you want to sit, Mr. Madison? Back or in front? Oh, I'll sit up front with you. Okay. Wait till I open the door for you. Go ahead, Mr. Madison. Nice work, Louie. You never even guessed you was there. All right. Get behind the wheel and let's get out of here. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes national security. Now let's hear from a typical American who has attained greater personal security thanks to his employer's cooperation and the Equitable Society. We've got a good boss in our company. Last year, he signed us up for complete group insurance protection, and brother, am I glad he did. You ought to be glad. You and your family are protected by life insurance, accident and sickness insurance, and a retirement income, plus hospital, medical, and surgical benefits for yourself and your wife and children. All in one package from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. And don't forget, no medical examination. But what I'd like to know is, how do I get so much for so little money? One reason is that your employer pays part of the cost. Besides, there are a lot of other employees in your group, so the Equitable Society is able to sell you insurance at, well, you might call it the wholesale price. It sure came in handy when my wife had our last baby. Why, before we had group insurance, my first two kids each put me in debt for a year. But this time, along comes a check from the Equitable Society right on the dot. It sure looked good to me. You know, group insurance was originated by the Equitable Life Assurance Society in 1911. If your company does not have group insurance, or if your company's group program is incomplete, your management can get in touch with the nearest Equitable Life Assurance Society office. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States.
And now, back to the FBI file, Blueprint for Murder. A little more than a year ago, the last shell was fired in World War II. A war which took Americans all over the face of the earth in an effort to retain a world in which we could live in peace. That war was fought because the citizens of the world allowed themselves the luxury of neglecting their worldly duties, of neglecting to clear up the festering sore spots that later threatened to infect every nation on earth. Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini were petty local grafters at one time. Petty local charlatans like the man in tonight's case from the files of your FBI. But it is a certain truth that from petty local tyrants come threatening national dictators. The place to start cleaning house is in your own backyard. Tonight's file continues in the living room of the Madison home. Special Agent Jim Taylor, in response to a frenzied phone call from Mary, has just arrived. Oh, Jim. Oh, Jim, what am I going to do? Mary, the first thing to do is pull yourself together. Come on. All right, Jim, I'll I'll try. Now, look, Frank is famous for having a lot of courage. Let's show everybody he hasn't got it all. Hmm? All right, I'm ready to help. How do I start? Good girl. Now, you said over the phone that a man called here for Frank last night. That's right. He said he was from Mr. Baker's. Well, I spoke to Baker after you called. He didn't send the telegram that Frank got. I know. I called him, too. I forgot to tell you that. Oh? Mary, anything else that you forgot to tell me? No, Jim. A black sedan, I don't know what make, pulled up in front of the house at 7 o'clock. Frank went out, got in the car, and I watched it speed across the state line. Early this morning, when Frank hadn't come home or called me, I called Mr. Baker. Then you called me. That's right. Now, Mary, try to remember this. It's very important. Has any other car been in your driveway since the car that took Frank away? No. No, none at all. And that was the only car in the driveway at all yesterday because Frank didn't drive down to the garage yesterday. Oh, why not? No reason. He just said he wanted to walk. He does that every once in a while. Well, okay, we've got something to work on anyway. It's not much, but it's a start. What is it? Well, there are some clear tire tracks in your driveway. I noticed them when I came up the walk. I can make a print out of them. And there's some red clay in the driveway that probably came off the tires of that car. Oh, yes, I noticed that this morning when I looked out. Well, we'll have the lab check on the clay. That's about all we can do right now. Well, I'm going to make those tire prints, Mary, and pick up some of that clay. I'll see you later. Come in. Hello, boys. Oh, hello, Louis. How are things going when you left? Oh, they was going fine. When does the case come up? Wednesday afternoon. And there'll be a postponement. And when it comes up next time, I don't think Mr. Madison will be so anxious to press any charge. Yeah, that shows a smart trick, boys. Now, Louis, you're sure you kept Madison blindfolded all the time he was in the car so he doesn't know where he was being taken? Oh, sure, boss. Yeah, right after I hit him, Buddy drove away, and while Madison was out, I put the tape over his eyes. He couldn't say nothing, I guarantee you, boss. That's fine. Anyone will be able to direct anyone to the cabin after he's set free on Thursday. Oh, you want me to take him down near Medford while he's still blindfolded and, and just let him out of the car? Huh? No, no, not you, Louis. I want Buddy to do that. Then I'll send Buddy away for a couple of months while the heat's on, and then... Everybody will forget all about it. Yeah, but, boys, what difference does it make if Buddy or me lets him go? Madison knows I was in on a job. He what? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, like I say, I taped his eyes real tight, but he come out of it after I clunked him, and he heard me talking right away. He said, hello, Louie. Oh, no. Why didn't you tell me that? Why'd you wait three whole days to tell me? Well, I didn't say it until just now. What should I do, sit down and write your letter from up there? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's have a little quiet. Yeah, boy. <sighs> Louie... You got still another job to do. Okay, boys, what is it? If Madison knows you worked on the job, then he can hook me into it, and we can't afford that. What do you want me to do? Just tell me, boys. Louis, you know the high ledge behind the cabin? Yeah, yeah, sure. Makes me dizzy when I look down. Madison's still blindfolded, isn't he? Yeah, I told you, boys. He's still taped up. He can't see nothing. Good. 
You drive back up to the cabin. You go in and talk to Madison and tell him you want to take a walk with him. Tell him the exercise will be good for him. Yeah. Uh, what happens? Uh... Do I have to draw pictures for you, Louis? Go for a walk with Madison. You walk up to the cliff and he keeps walking. There's snow in that canyon. Nobody will find the body until spring. Oh. Hey, cheap boys, you sure got brains. Never mind that. Back in the car and get up that cabin. Hasn't anything come of any of your leads, Jim? No, nothing yet, Mary. I, I, I don't think I can stand this very much longer. Hold on to yourself. These cases sometimes run this way. You don't get a thing for days, and then, well, everything happens at once. What happened with that red clay? Anything? Our petrographic experts are working on it, Mary. I can't do a thing till I hear from them. And there wasn't anything in those deeds down in the county courthouse? No, Mary, not a thing. If Douglas had Frank kidnapped by some of his henchmen, he's holding him somewhere that's not registered in his name. I wish Frank had never gotten mixed up in this thing. Oh, Mary, you'll be proud he did when he gets back. Oh, then... Do Jim. I really think he'll be back? I certainly... Oh, dear God. He'll be all right. But, Mary, you won't be all right unless you get some sleep. Oh, how could I sleep? I'll call you the minute anything breaks. Now, I'll get it. All right. Hello? Yes, this is Taylor. Oh, hello, Gordon. Yes. Where? Yeah. Yeah, I see. Okay, thanks. Tell the office I'll be in touch with them later. What is it, Jim? It's the first break we've gotten. One of the agents down at the office found out Douglas likes to go hunting. Hunting? How does that help us? Well, they checked through the newspaper files, found a picture of Douglas on a hunting trip up at Mount Bell. Well, I... I let, let me finish, Mary. Then the office had the petrographic expert check the red clay from your driveway against some standards they had from Mount Bell. And they matched? As closely as those samples ever match. What are you going to do then, Jim? I'm going on a hunting trip, Mary. Up to Mount Bell, hunting for Frank. And remember the Red River Valley. Hey, buddy. Uh, huh? What? I don't want you to think I'm not grateful for all the entertainment, but I want to know who you work for. You work for Douglas or for Louis? I don't know what you're talking about. I keep telling you that. You don't expect me to believe that you own this place, do you? Why not? Ain't much of a place. Where would you get the money to buy it? From a fiddle. I get big money for playing this. Why, it would take a monkey three years to pick up enough to buy a hunting lodge. That ain't a nice thing to say about my music, mister. Well, I'm sorry, but... Oh, we've got company. Shut up. Who's there? Okay. How's it been acting? Oh, fine. We ain't had no trouble at all. What's the reason for the visit, Louie? Did Mr. Douglas get soft-hearted all of a sudden? Shut up. <laughs> talk when you talk to. Now stay quiet. You big, brave man. I'll bet you wouldn't mind fighting anybody if he was blind. <laughs> you... <laughs> said shut up. Hey, hey, Louie, I thought he said not to muss this guy up. That's off now. Hey, you. You mean me? Yeah, you. What? Get up. Where's his coat, buddy? You gonna spring him now? Nah. Just gonna take him for a little walk. The exercise will do him good. Uh, here, I'll get his coat. You want me to come along? No, you got enough for exercise. Hey, Mr. Madden, put your arms out. I got your coat in back of you. Thanks, buddy. You feel this thing I got pressed against your face? Feels cold. Feels like a gun. That's just what it is. What's that for? That's to use on you. Just in case you decide to scream when we get out on the road, if there's anybody around. There won't be. I've been listening for three days. It's okay, Frank. It's me, Jim. Jim, holy... Frank! What's the name of the one who didn't have the gun? That's Buddy. Okay, Buddy. Just stand still. You don't carry a gun, huh? Oh, no, sir. I ain't a killer. All right, go stand against that wall. Go on. The other one's name is Louie. Did you kill him? No, I just winged him. Hit him in the shooting arm. Wait till I pick up his gun. Hey, Jim. 
rip this stuff off my eyes, will no, you? No, we'd better have a doctor in town to that, Frank. Okay. How'd you find me here? Well, the red clay your friend's tires left in your driveway wasn't found anywhere in the state except up here. Up where? Where am I? Near the top of Mount Bell. So I just went from cabin to cabin until I found a garage that had a car with a tire that matched the impression they left in your driveway. And, well, here I am. Boy, you make it sound easy. Look, Jim, there's, there's a phone in the bedroom off to the right. Will you lead me in there so I can call Mary? Sure, Frank. But then we've got to hurry. What's the big rush? This is Wednesday. And in just two hours, your case against Douglas comes up. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's get rolling. Walter Douglas was never tried and convicted of causing Frank Madison to be kidnapped because he committed suicide. His accomplices, Charles Buddy Cook and Louis Young, both received long sentences in a federal penitentiary. And so another crime was prevented. Another murder in this country's growing crop of homicide. Prevented by the quick work of your FBI, whose job it is to protect your lives and your properties, but whose even more important job is to protect the civil liberties that American citizens have under our Constitution. A charter that grants you your right to free speech, your right to freedom of religion, and your right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Your FBI is honored to have so important an assignment, and it means to continue to serve you, the American people, as well in the future as it has in the past. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now, one last word to business executives. Since group insurance was originated by the Equitable Life Assurance Society 35 years ago, Thousands of employers have learned that group insurance means satisfied workers, builds loyalty and morale, decreases labor turnover, improves quality and quantity of production. Get all the facts and figures from an Equitable Society group insurance expert. Whether your employees are entirely uninsured or have only partial protection, get in touch with the nearest office or write direct to the New York home office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Frightened Fugitives. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's broadcast was directed by William M. Sweet. The music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. And your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Frightened Fugitive, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.